Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries Gallipoli Campaign The Gallipoli Campaign, also known as the Dardanelles Campaign, the Battle of Gallipoli, or the Battle of Sunkale, was a campaign of the First World War that took place on the Gallipoli Peninsula in the Ottoman Empire between 17 February 1915 and 9 January 1916. The peninsula forms the northern bank of the Dardanelles, a strait that provided a sea route to the Russian Empire, one of the Allied powers, during the war. Intending to secure it, Russia's allies, Britain and France, launched a naval attack followed by an amphibious landing on the peninsula, with the aim of capturing the Ottoman capital of Constantinople. The naval attack was repelled, and after eight months fighting, with many ca casualties on both sides, the land campaign was abandoned and the invasion force was withdrawn to Egypt. The campaign was the only major Ottoman victory of the war. In Turkey, it is regarded as a defining moment in the nation's history. A final surge in the defense of the motherland as the Ottoman Empire crumbled. The struggle formed the basis for the Turkish War of Independence and the declaration of the Republic of Turkey eight years later, with Mustafa Kemal as president, who rose to prominence as a commander at Gallipoli. The campaign is often considered to be the beginning of Australian and New Zealand national consciousness. The 25th of April the anniversary of the landings, is known as Anzac Day, the most significant commemoration of military casualties and veterans in the two countries, surpassing Remembrance Day. Ottoman Entry into the War At the beginning of the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire had the reputation of being the sick man of Europe. Following a century of slow decline, weakened by political instability, military defeat, civil strife and uprisings by national minorities, in 1908, a group of young officers, known as the Young Turks, seized power in Constantinople. Sultan Mehmed V was installed as a figurehead in 1909. The new regime implemented a program of reform to modernize the outdated political and economic system and to redefine the racial character of the empire. Germany, an enthusiastic supporter, provided significant investment. German diplomats gained influence and German officers assisted in training and re-equipping the army. Despite Britain being the predominant power in the region, the economic resources of the Ottoman Empire were depleted by the cost of the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913 and the French, British and Germans had offered financial aid. A pro-German faction influenced by Enver Pasha, the former Ottoman military attaché in Berlin, opposed the pro-British majority in the Ottoman cabinet and tried to secure closer relations with Germany. In December 1913, the Germans sent a military mission to Constantinople, headed by General Otto Lehmann von Sanders. The geographical position of the Ottoman Empire meant that Russia France, and Britain had a significant interest in Turkish neutrality in the event of war in Europe. During the Sarajevo crisis in 1914, German diplomats offered Turkey an anti-Russian alliance and territorial gains in Caucasia, northwest Iran and Transcaspia. The pro-British faction in the cabinet was isolated due to the British ambassador taking leave until 18 August. As the crisis deepened in Europe, Ottoman policy was to obtain a guarantee of territorial integrity and potential advantages, unaware that the British might enter a European war. On 30 July 1914, two days after the outbreak of the war in Europe, the Ottoman leaders agreed to form a secret Ottoman-German alliance against Russia, although it did not require them to undertake military action. On 2 August, the British requisitioned two modern battleships, and which were under construction in British shipyards for the Ottoman Navy, for their own use, alienating pro-British elements in Constantinople, despite the offer of compensation if they remained neutral. This action strained diplomatic relations between the two empires and the German government offered into the Ottoman Navy as replacements. In an attempt to gain influence, the Allies tried to intercept the ships, which escaped when the Ottoman government opened the Dardanelles to allow them passage to Constantinople, despite being required under international law as a neutral party to block military shipping. Allowing the German ships to enter the Dardanelles demonstrated the Ottoman alignment with Germany. In September, the British naval mission to the Ottomans, which had been established in 1912 under Admiral Arthur Limpus, was recalled due to increasing concern that Turkey would enter the war and Rear Admiral Wilhelm Souchon of the Imperial German Navy, 
took command of the Ottoman Navy, acting without orders from the Ottoman government. On 27 September, the German commander of the Dardanelles fortifications ordered the passage closed, adding to the impression that the Ottomans were pro-German. The German naval presence and the success of the German armies in Europe gave the pro-German faction in the Ottoman government enough influence to declare war on Russia. On 27 October, Goeben and Breslau, having been renamed and conducted the Black Sea raid, a sortie into the Black Sea, where they bombarded the Russian port of Odessa and sank several ships. The Ottomans refused an allied demand that they expel the German missions, and on 31 October 1914, formally entered the war on the side of the Central Powers. Russia declared war on Turkey on 2 November. The next day the British ambassador left Constantinople and a British naval squadron off the Dardanelles bombarded the outer defensive forts at Kumkale on the northern Asian coast and Sed al Bahir on on the southern tip of the Gallipoli Peninsula, a British shell hit a magazine in one of the forts, knocked the guns off their mounts and killed Britain. And France declared war on Turkey on 5 November and the Ottomans declared the jihad later that month, beginning the Caucasus campaign, with an offensive against the Russians, to regain former Ottoman provinces. The Mesopotamian campaign began with a British landing at Basra, to control the oil facilities in the Persian Gulf. The Ottomans prepared to attack Egypt in early 1915, aiming to occupy the Suez Canal and cut the Mediterranean route to India and the Far East. The historian Hugh Strachan wrote that in hindsight, Ottoman belligerence was inevitable. Once and were allowed into the Dardanelles and that delays after that were caused by Ottoman unreadiness for war and Bulgarian neutrality, rather than uncertainty about policy. Allied strategy and the Dardanelles before the Dardanelles operation was conceived, the British had planned to conduct an amphibious invasion near Alexandretta on the Mediterranean Sea, an idea originally presented by Boghos Nubar in 1914. This plan was developed by the Secretary of State for War, Field Marshal Earl Kitchener to sever the capital from Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. Alexandretta was an area with a Christian population, and was the strategic center of the empire's railway network its capture would have cut the empire in two. Vice Admiral Sir Richard Pearce, East Indies Station, ordered Captain Frank Larkin of to Alexandretta on 13 December 1914. At the same time, in the same area, the and the French cruiser were performing similar operations. Kitchener was working on the plan as late as March 1915. This plan was also the beginning of Britain's successful effort to start an Arab revolt. The Alexandretta landing was abandoned because militarily it would have required more resources than France could allocate, and politically France did not want the British operating in their sphere of influence, a position to which Britain had agreed in 1912. By late 1914 the war on the Western Front had become a stalemate. The Franco-British counter-offensive of the First Battle of the Marne had ended, and the British had suffered many casualties in the First Battle of Ypres in Flanders. Lines of trenches had been dug by both sides, running from the Swiss border to the English Channel as the war of manoeuvre ended and trench warfare began. The German Empire and Austria-Hungary closed the overland trade routes between Britain and France in the west and Russia in the east. The White Sea in the Arctic north and the Sea of Ohotsk in the Far East were icebound in winter and distant from the Eastern Front. The Baltic Sea was blockaded by the Kaiserliche Marine and the entrance to the Black Sea through the Dardanelles was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. While the empire remained neutral supplies could still be sent to Russia through the Dardanelles, but prior to the Ottoman entry into the war the straits had been closed and in November they began to mine the waterway. French Minister of Justice Aristide Briand's proposal in November to attack the Ottoman Empire was rejected and an attempt by the British to pay the Ottomans to join the Allied side also failed. Later that month, Winston Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty, proposed a naval attack on the Dardanelles, based in part on erroneous reports of Ottoman troop strength. Churchill wanted to use a large number of obsolete battleships, which could not operate against the German high seas fleet, in a Dardanelles operation, with a small occupation force provided by the army. It was hoped that an attack on the Ottomans would also draw Bulgaria and Greece into the war on the Allied side. On 2 January 1915, Grand Duke Nicholas of Russia appealed to Britain for assistance against the Ottomans, who were conducting an offensive in the Caucasus. 
planning began for a naval demonstration in the Dardanelles to divert troops from the Caucasian theater of operations. Attempt to force the Straits On 17 February 1915, a British seaplane from flew a reconnaissance sortie over the Straits. Two days later, the first attack on the Dardanelles began when a strong Anglo-French task force, including the British battleship, began a long-range bombardment of Ottoman coastal artillery batteries. The British had intended to use eight aircraft from Ark Royal to spot for the bombardment, but harsh conditions rendered all but one of these, a short Type 136, unserviceable. A period of bad weather slowed the initial phase, but by 25 February the outer forts had been reduced and the entrance cleared of mines. After this, Royal Marines were landed to destroy guns at Kumkail and Sed al Bahir, while the naval bombardment shifted to batteries between Kumkail and Kefes, frustrated by the mobility of the Ottoman batteries, which evaded the Allied bombardments and threatened the minesweepers sent. To clear the straits, Churchill began pressuring the naval commander, Admiral Sackville Carden, to increase the fleet's efforts. Carden drew up fresh plans and on 4 March sent a cable to Churchill stating that the fleet could expect to arrive in Constantinople within 14 days. A sense of impending victory was heightened by the interception of a German wireless message that revealed the Ottoman Dardanelles forts were running out of ammunition. When the message was relayed to Cardin, it was agreed a main attack would be launched on or around 17 March. It transpired that Cardin, suffering from stress, was placed on the sick list by the medical officer and command was taken over by Admiral John Drobeck. 18 18th of March 1915 On the 18th of March 1915 the main attack was launched by the allied fleet comprising with an array of cruisers and destroyers against the narrowest point of the Dardanelles where the straits are 1 mile wide despite some damage to the allied ships engaging the forts from ottoman return fire minesweepers were ordered along the straits According to the Ottoman official account, by 2 p.m., all telephone wires were cut, all communications with the forts were interrupted, some of the guns had been knocked out. In consequence the artillery fire of the defense had slackened considerably. This struck a mine, causing it to capsize with her crew of over. Minesweepers, manned by civilians, retreated under Ottoman artillery fire, leaving the minefields largely intact, and detonated mines and sank. Although there was confusion during the battle about the cause of the damage, some blamed torpedoes, sent to rescue the irresistible, was damaged by an explosion and eventually sank. The French battleships and were also damaged. The ships had sailed through a new line of mines placed secretly by the Ottoman Minilayan user it ten days before. The losses forced de Robeck to sound the general recall to protect what remained of his force. During the planning of the campaign, naval losses had been anticipated, and so mainly obsolete battleships, unfit to face the German fleet, had been sent. Some of the senior naval officers like the commander of Queen Elizabeth, Commodore Roger Keyes, felt that they had come close to victory, believing that the Ottoman guns had almost run out of ammunition. But the views of de Robeck, the First Sea Lord Jackie Fisher and others prevailed. This ended Allied attempts to force the Straits using naval power due to unacceptable losses and bad weather. Planning to capture the Turkish defences by land began and two Allied submarines tried to traverse the Dardanelles, but were lost to mines and the strong currents. Allied landing preparations After the failure of the naval attacks, troops were assembled to eliminate the Ottoman mobile artillery, which was preventing the Allied minesweepers from clearing the way for the larger vessels. Kitchener appointed General Sir Ian Hamilton to command the of the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force. Soldiers from the Australian Imperial Force and New Zealand Expeditionary Force were encamped in Egypt, undergoing training prior to being sent to France. The Australian and New Zealand troops were formed into the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, comprising the Volunteer 1st Australian Division and the New Zealand and Australian Division. The Anzac troops were joined by the regular 29th Division and the Royal Naval Division. The French Corps Expeditionnaire d'Orient, consisting of Metropolitan and Colonial troops, was subsequently placed under Hamilton's command. Over the following month, Hamilton prepared his plan and the British and French divisions joined the Australians in Egypt. 
Hamilton chose to concentrate on the southern part of the Gallipoli Peninsula at Cape Hellas and Sedol Bahia, where an unopposed landing was expected. The Allies initially discounted the fighting ability of the Ottoman soldiers. The naivete of the Allied planners was illustrated by a leaflet that was issued to the British and Australians while they were still in Egypt. The underestimation of Ottoman military potential stemmed from a sense of superiority among the Allies because of the decline of the Ottoman Empire and its poor performance in Libya in 1911 and the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913. Allied intelligence failed to adequately prepare for the campaign, in some cases relying on information gained from Egyptian travel guides. The troops for the assault were loaded on transports in the order they were to disembark, causing a long delay which meant that many troops, including the French at Mudros, were forced to detour to Alexandria to embark on the ships that would take them into battle. A five-week delay until the end of April ensued, during which the Ottomans strengthened their defenses on the peninsula. Although bad weather during March and April might have delayed the landings anyway, preventing supply and reinforcement. Following preparations in Egypt, Hamilton and his headquarters staff arrived at Mudros on 10 April. The Anzac Corps departed Egypt in early April, and assembled on the island of Lemnos in Greece on 12 April, where a small garrison had been established in early March, and practice landings were undertaken. The British 29th Division departed for Mudras on 7 April, and the Royal Naval Division rehearsed on the island of Skyros, after arriving there on 17 the April. That day, the British submarine tried to run the straits, but hit a submarine net ran aground and was shelled by a Turkish fort, killing Brody and six of the crew. The survivors were forced to surrender. The Allied fleet and British and French troops assembled at Mudros, ready for the landings, but poor weather. From 19 March grounded Allied aircraft for nine days and on 24 days only a partial program of reconnaissance flights were possible. Ottoman Defensive Preparations the Ottoman force prepared to repel a landing on either side of the Straits was the 5th Army. This force, which initially consisted of five divisions with another en route, was a conscript force, commanded by von Sanders. Many of the senior officers in the 5th Army were also German. Ottoman commanders and senior German officers debated the best means of defending the peninsula. All agreed that the best defense was to hold the high ground on the ridges of the peninsula. There was disagreement as to where the enemy would land and hence where to concentrate forces. Lieutenant Colonel Mustafa Kemal was familiar with the Gallipoli Peninsula from his operations against Bulgaria in the Balkan Wars and forecast that Cape Pellas and Gaba TP were the likely areas for landing. Kemal believed that the British would use their naval power to command the land from every side at the tip of the peninsula. At Gaba TP, the short distance to the east and coast meant that the Allies could easily reach the Narrows. Sanders considered Basika Bay on the Asiatic coast to be the most vulnerable to invasion, since the terrain was easier to cross and was convenient to attack the most important Ottoman batteries guarding the Straits and a third of the 5th Army was assembled there. Two divisions were concentrated at Bulair at the north end of the Gallipoli Peninsula to protect supply and communication lines to the defences further down the peninsula. The 19th Division and the 9th Division were placed along the Aegean coast and at Cape Hellas on the tip of the peninsula. Sanders kept the bulk of the Ottoman forces inland in reserve, leaving a minimum of troops guarding the coast. The 3rd Division and a cavalry brigade arrived from Constantinople in early April, bringing the front line strength of the Ottomans up, to which Sanders concentrated in three groups. A maximum effort to improve land and sea communications was ordered to move reinforcements swiftly to danger points and troops moved at night to avoid Allied air reconnaissance. Sanders' strategy was opposed by Ottoman commanders, including Kemal, who believed that the defenders were too widely dispersed to defeat the invasion on the beaches. Sanders was certain that a rigid system of defense would fail and that the only hope of success lay in the mobility of the three groups particularly the 19th Division near Bogali, in general reserve, ready to move to Bulair, Gaba TP or the Asiatic shore. The time needed by the British to organize the landings meant that Sanders, Colonel Hans Gangesser and other German officers, supported by 3 Corps Command Resat Pasha, had more time to prepare their defenses. Sanders later noted, the British allowed us four good weeks of respite for all this work before their great disembarkation. 
This respite just sufficed for the most indispensable measures to be taken. Roads were constructed, small boats built to carry troops and equipment across the narrows, beaches were wired and improvised mines were constructed, from torpedo warheads. Trenches and gun emplacements were dug along the beaches and troops went on route marches to avoid lethargy. Kamal, whose 19th Division was vital to the defensive scheme, observed the beaches and awaited signs of an invasion from his post at Bogali, near Meadows. The Ottomans created a small air force with German assistance and had four aircraft operating around Sankil in February, conducting reconnaissance and army cooperation sorties. From 11 April, an Ottoman aircraft made frequent flights over Mudros, keeping watch on the assembly of the British naval force and an airfield was established near Gallipoli. Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries Would you like to know more?